Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. It is 3 p.m. here in the UK and it's 10 a.m. Eastern time. And you're all most welcome to join us here at Zero Days Live. Hello there, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday, where in a few moments we'll be joined in our virtual studios by our very own Chief Information Security Officer, Kath Golding. But before that, a quick reminder uh, about yesterday, where we spoke to Gary Hibbard, Director at Cyberfort, to cover the questions we should be asking to achieve GDPR and ISO 27001, where he made the very important distinction between the two, whereas one is the law and the other is a best practice framework, though both are playing an increasingly important role for organisations of all sizes. Also, a heads up that tomorrow we'll be welcoming Alex Crompton, Head of Security Consulting at BAE Systems, where he joins us to talk about managing security through sustained emergency situations, such as the one we're seeing right now with COVID-19. Hello, everybody. Uh, hope you're well. Uh, I'm Stuart Reid and I'm with Nominet, focused on cyber solutions. And as usual, I'll be in the chair today to welcome our special guests, uh, not just today, but each and every day of our live shows. And just a quick reminder that Nominet is primarily known for managing the .uk domain space, uh, which we've been doing so for about 23 years or so, uh, and have something in the order of 15 million domains currently under management. And building on the strong heritage of understanding the importance of domain names for network connectivity, we also provide cybersecurity solutions to protect both government and enterprise networks worldwide from cyber attacks, including providing service to the UK government's National Cyber Security Centre. Ensuring people are connected, included and secure is at the heart of what we do at Nominet. And it is important perhaps now more than ever uh, that we uh, ensure those things are taking place. And with that in mind, we wanted to bring you an interactive show to bridge the gap that's been left behind by the lack of physical meetings taking place right now and bring you Zero Days Live for everyone with an interest in or from within the cybersecurity community. Now, I'm joined front of house and behind the scenes here uh, with a highly capable team, making sure everything runs just the way it should, albeit remotely. Uh, and speaking of remotely, uh, that's what we all are right now. Um, and this week's burning question is, what's your worst isolation purchase? So please do let us know by typing in the console on the screen. Uh, today, for me, a new one uh, is car tax. I've just retaxed my car and I'm guessing it's something that most people don't particularly look forward to paying um, uh, at the best of times really but my car has been stood still and off-road uh, for so long now that it's got weeds growing on it um, but still I've just had to uh, renew my tax uh, although I guess the flip side is that uh, the permitted exercise is going well for me uh, and speaking of well Steve how are you today? Hi Stuart, I'm good thanks. Yourself? Jolly good. Yeah, very good thank you. Apart from paying my car tax today, it's a nice sunny mm. day out here actually, so I've enjoyed yeah. my uh, permitted exercise. How about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm certainly with you on that car tax thing. Uh, that's, a, that's a pain. In fact, anything to do with the car, tax, insurance, everything, I'm uh, yeah, feeling a little bit sore about paying for that. Yeah, I can well imagine it. So is that one of yours today, Steve? Or have you got something different for us? Actually, I've got, I've got something different. So I purchased this. It's a wireless charger. Obviously, you have to connect it up. Um, but given that I'm sat at my desk in my office for you know pretty much um, a good proportion of the day, I'm starting to think, what was the point in this? It charges my phone slower than the, pl the plugged in charger. And <laughs> I've got all my cables around me. It's like, why what was the point in that so uh, if anyone could answer that question for me i'd be uh, really interested to hear how i could make better use of my wireless charger well you heard it here everybody so please do let steve know your comments by typing them into the uh, console on your screen um but yeah i can't think of a good reason for that maybe you could use it as a drinks coaster oh that's a good one maybe yeah. keep it warm yeah, indeed. It might do indeed. Keep your warm drinks. Um, so thank you very much for that, Steve. Uh, now, this show really isn't the same without you all tuning in and joining us at home. Um, and we're delighted to welcome back our regulars and also new audience members each and every day as we seek to build an accessible community to bring people together, hear from others in the industry, get a roundup of what's going on in the news, share some thoughts on best practice and, of course, interject some good humour along the way, too. 
Now, with that in mind, whilst we do cover a lot of important subjects, we don't take ourselves too seriously. And while I'm on the subject of community, uh, we have very recently uh, started our uh, Zero Days Live community uh, on LinkedIn. So if you would like to join that uh, and look for all the latest updates, then please do so. We would welcome you uh, to that with open arms. Now, as a quick reminder, each of our 30 minute or so shows uh, that we uh, produce here are absolutely live each and every day. And as such, uh, there is bound to be some mild blips along the way. And for regulars to the show, uh, you will have noticed that we have had a few blips along the way. Uh, but when they do happen, uh, we hope they, that you do all agree that it's just part of the reason you tune in to see us. And it's part of your natural authenticity of our show. Uh, and also remember that whilst we are live each and every day, we're also on demand for your convenience too. So if for any reason you miss a show or are not able to join the whole show, you're able to uh, get the whole thing on demand uh, downloaded to your device of choice. So please do check us out at nominatecyber.com forward slash zero days live. And also, please do get involved um, if during today's show or any of the other live shows that you join us, uh, you want to ask a question or give a comment, please do so using the console on your screen and Kerry will read them out during the webcast. And speaking of Kerry, how are you today? I'm really good, thank you Stuart. Jolly good, good to see you there. Um, so what is your isolation purchase that's uh, probably uh, not as uh, sensible as others that you've made? No, so today I am going to share with you um, what I'm actually just really disappointed about this one. I bought literally as we went into lockdown, beautiful pair of Kurt Geiger boots um, that I was really looking forward to wearing. And I think since we've been in lockdown, I've worn slippers, trainers and flip flops. <laughs> well, on the flip side, though, Kerry, um, you haven't scuffed them. So they're not they're in pristine condition. So, you know, every cloud. <laughs> Steve, you, you yeah, I was just up. thinking perhaps we could do a show next week where we just look at our feet just so you can wear them and, and get them on camera, Kerry. Yes, sock day. Yeah, maybe we should change sock day for our next fun Friday, which of course it's because it's a short week this week and it's not happening this week, but we will do it next week. How about that instead? Instead of doing guess the socks, let's do guess guess the footwear for next time. Good call, well, Steve. I think we're we're all going to guess Kerry's now, aren't we? <laughs> well, unless we've all got a pair of those, in which case we could confuse the uh, the guest on that show. Absolutely. Good, good shout. Anyway, we should do that. Uh, again, please do uh, get involved, um, everybody um, who's uh, who's joining in to, to join us. Um, anything that uh, you want to provide comment or question about, or indeed share with us what your uh, worst isolation purchase has been uh, during uh, lockdown, please do let us know by typing that into your console. Now, as I mentioned just a couple of moments ago, uh, today we're welcoming to our virtual studios, uh, Kath Golding, Nominet's very own CISO or Chief Information Security Officer. But before we meet her, I uh, just wanted to take a bit of a sneak peek uh, at the video uh, that we uh, reproduced with Kath when we caught up with her as part of our Security Begins Here edition just a few weeks ago. So take a look at this. to make sure cybersecurity is right there at the start of any projects. So anything new that a company is bringing in, um, if, you, if you address cybersecurity at the start, then, then hopefully you can get security by default, which is the optimum requirement really, um, and then address some of those legacy systems to see if there's any existing vulnerabilities to try and treat those as well. The trick is how you manage legacy and new applications at the same time. A common one at the moment is about cloud security and um, often, like you say, there's legacy. People have been reliant on this sort of castle mentality where you've got um, layers of security, defence in depth, so um, you're relying on firewalls and access controls that previously exist, so you're just putting in a new application. But when you're um, going through digital transformation and putting in new things in the cloud, um, then you have to look at that hybrid scenario and again making sure the requirements are there from the start because 
When you're outsourcing you know, a new system or application, um, the supplier will only do what you tell them to do. It, it's not about um, you know, protecting the walls and making the walls higher, it's about ensuring the contracts have everything in them that they should do to ensure all those you know, defense, defense in depth practices are incorporated into that um, new system. I work in the DNS industry, Nominet were a, a registry, um, and there's um, been a huge incident about DNS hijacking. I propose that we need to put two-factor authentication on for all our registrars, they're like our channel. Um, and this was met with you know, quite a bit of reluctance because at the time, this was quite a few years ago, and two-factor authentication was, not everybody had smartphones and it was a bit cumbersome. and. Um, so it was seen as sort of a bit backwards. It's about trying to be an enabler, showing the evidence of what the issue is and what could be the consequences if we don't implement it. We were one of the leading registries to do that and lots of registries have sort of followed our, our lead subsequently. Excellent. Um, so without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome to our virtual studios, Kath Golding. Hi there, Kath. How are you? Are you there, Kath? Can you hear me? I can hear you. We just can't see you yet. Where are you? There we go. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. I, Good I was to see just you there, coming Kat. over the. Uh, it's, it's horrible to see yourself in a video. I've never seen that. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's one of those things you just got to get used to now because it's it's a common way that everyone's working. And actually, that kind of neatly brings me on to to the first question because you uh, you, you talked in your video uh, about digital transformation, and clearly that's something we're finding ourselves in uh, right now. Um, and um, one of the things I thought was interesting. In your uh, in your video just then was that you mentioned that cybersecurity needs to be considered at the start of the project. Um, how, how are you going to advise, um, or what would you advise that CISOs um, do to get involved in those conversations early on? Um, so I think increasingly um, a CISO needs to build strong relationships with um, you know stakeholders across the business. Um, so I'd say your your best friends should be. Uh, the project management office, people that are, that are working with these projects day in, day out, and also those that are engaging with suppliers, the supplier management or the contractual people. And so that you can, um, you know, say to them to alert you when there is um, a new project or new transformation uh, project going on so that you can you can get in and put, you know, at the very least, um you know the the line to say security requirements need to be considered here um but it is important as i said in that video which is awful um <laughs> that you want to be seen as an enabler rather than as an obstacle um and and so you know it's about uh saying it, it's more efficient if you do it up front and build it into the design um because if you don't and then it gets to the end we're going to have to um you know try and get compliant with, with whatever uh, compliance requirements there are that might be broader than just that contract um, to, to make it fit. Um, so that'd be my recommendations, yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. And also, the, as I mentioned just now, the, the, the theme of digital transformation is probably uh, more pertinent now perhaps than, than ever before. We've, we've we found ourselves all working remotely now uh, and there's been a, a digital revolution uh, of some degree or, or other for, for a lot of organizations as they adapt to this new normal. Now, one thing that I didn't ask you at the, at the top of this, which I, I really should do, is, is um, given that we're in this very strange situation now, uh, what's your worst isolation purchase? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, my worst one, um, and it did impact me um, from a work perspective, um, so it wasn't very clever, but uh, I, I gave my 11-year-old son, I said, right, you can spend £100 at the beginning of this, of his own money, um, but they have to be sort of purchases that will that will help you during this period of lockdown, you know, because he won't be seeing much of his friends and, and things like that. So he decided, which I thought was a really good idea, a, a new video game um, all about Star Wars and it was great, but he, it wasn't um, 
you couldn't get it on his switch so it was on the pc so i'm like well okay you can use my laptop my personal laptop that's fine um and so it took an age to download after we'd paid for it um and then it wouldn't even run. So, and when it was running, it was slowing down the Wi-Fi because it was so intensive. And it's the first wow. time we've ever had one of these big games on a on a well, not a proper gaming PC. It's just on a regular laptop. So yeah, noob, noob mom here. Um, and so yeah, he's he's not used it after that first day because he can't, you know, it just doesn't work properly. It's not powerful enough, and it and it bottled up the. Um, it clogged up the uh, the Wi-Fi, so that was a waste of money. Well, I, and actually, that's probably something a lot of people can relate to. For, for regulars of this show, uh, they'll uh, they recognise that uh, we've encountered a few network challenges as well. So I think that's probably quite a common theme. Uh, if it's not all the uh, videos that are streaming, it's the games that are playing as well. So uh, yeah, I think that's something that everyone can can resonate uh, or relate to um, that's uh, that's joining us. So pre appreciate you sharing that one with us, Kath. Um, <laughs> touch on a point that you made um, uh, just a, a few moments ago is around you know, being seen uh, not as a hindrance um, uh, within the organisations um, to, to kind of um, be part of those decisions um, early on for organisations. Um, do you think that there really is that perception that um, the, the security team seen as a hindrance to, to digital transformation programmes or is that something that's slightly more mythical? Well, I think it depends on the on the transformation project that you know what you what you're trying to achieve. I mean, if it is about security, then you know that that's fantastic. Um, but probably generally, I think security does have a bad reputation sometimes because it's um, you know it was always seen as like the gatekeeper and the person that said yes or no. It's been quite black and white. Uh, and I think you know increasingly, yeah, the, the CISO is about you know you, you should be more flexible. Um, and it's not about, well, this is the policy, so you, you must adhere to that. Um, it's about sort of the, the principles behind security policies. And so, you know, instead of you've got to work with the project um, to, to make sure things remain secure. And, and that might actually mean you have to adapt your policies um, because it will benefit the, the broader business. Um, but uh, you should you should be open to that as a CISO rather than sort of seeing yourself as the, you know, the, the sort of police gatekeeper as, uh, you know, somebody that says yes or no. Um, so so maybe that's often why it's, you know, we've, we've got a bad reputation of being a hindrance in, in transformation. It's because, you know, people have to, uh, you know, try to adhere to all these policies, policies and make it give it additional complexity. Um, but in the long run, as we as we all know, you know, if you do make it secure by design um, and think about it up front, then as a business, it, it should be more cost effective for you, not least because it will stop you from being. And hacked. actually, you you the, you raise an, another interesting point there in terms of the secure by design, because obviously that's starting with a clean sheet of paper is always the the, the kind of the, the panacea in terms of making sure that you're embedding that security. But you did also mention that there is a challenge of integrating new um, approaches with what's already there, the kind of legacy infrastructure. Uh, could you explain a little bit further why this is a particular risk for security, bringing in the kind of the new against the old stuff that's already there? Um, yeah, well, like I was saying in um, in the video, um, you know, when when you and and take sort of cloud versus on prem as a you know sort of very classic but basic example and that you know when you, when you've got an on-prem solution you've you've got all sorts of things in place like your your firewalls your monitoring solution how you're doing doing patching um the access management vpns it, it's all kind of there so if you insert a new service or um product into it, it it's sort of already already protected by these layers um and uh so it, yeah if you're starting a new service in the cloud um, it might use completely different access management system. Um, you've got different monitoring solutions, uh, you know, completely different um, antivirus type protection and, and things like that. It's probably all built into the into the service that you're buying. Um, but at the same time, 
you know, as a CISO, it, it, you shouldn't necessarily say, well, no, that's not possible because clearly, you know, the business has a desire to do it. So it's about getting those requirements in and sort of saying, well, you know, yes, uh, the accounts need to have 2FA or whatever it is on it. Mm -hmm. And let's decide whether we want the, you know, monitoring should be um, done as best practice because there's some um, sensitive data in there or, or whatever. Um, and so it should be monitored and whether you're outsourcing that entirely or whether you've got a hybrid and you're bringing in the, the logs into your existing solution or, or doing something else entirely. So you've got to sort of think about how you're going to integrate security across, you know, the, the things that you're transforming um, compared to with what, what you're running in your legacy systems, what will remain. And, and how do you overcome some of these security risks? Is, is there a framework or is there a checklist that uh, is advisable for something like this? Um, checklist, crikey. I mean, there's all sorts of, um, you know, so ISO 27001 and, and NIST regular compliance and, um, and guidance out there. Um, but it, it is a bit of, um, you know, a minefield really, because sometimes, you know, if you look at those, general guidance or compliance or you know ISO 27001 they're, they're very generic um, and and they're not specific about a particular um, service type or, or security you know there are security elements in there like you've got to have antivirus or, or whatever it is but when you're looking at um, buying a new a new service say it's a cloud service then you know you're you're trying to to map your kind of security theoretical requirements with with what this vendor is telling you they can provide with it so um increasingly yes you know we we all know that there's there's more risk now in our supply chain so it's about getting assurances from you know if you are transforming into the cloud or outsourcing parts of it it's making sure that those services are uh, you know, you've got high levels of assurance or the level of assurance that you want um, mm. that equates with, with your own business. Okay, thank you. And um, in case you hadn't noticed, Kath, uh, Steve has popped up on screen, uninvited as usual, which can only mean <laughs> one thing, that he's raising his virtual hand to ask a question of his own. So what have you got, Steve? I am. I didn't realise I needed an invitation uh, all this time we've been doing this show and I didn't realise that, so apologies. <laughs> uh, Kath, um, so you mentioned a couple of uh, things there around legislation and compliance and, and I guess sometimes digital transformation is enforced on an organisation to meet that new legislation or that, or that, that, um, that particular compliance requirement. Can you talk us through how you approach that from a CISO's perspective? How do you go about trying, trying to uh, uh, achieve that legislation or, or compliance through digital transformation? Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it really depends. But over the last few years, yeah, we have seen quite a, a growth with, um, for us, you know, there's been GDPR. Uh, we now come under the um, NIS regulations, Network Information Security, which is new legislation. Um, we run various government contracts. So the you need to have cyber essentials um, as well as you know quite complex security requirements as part of the as part of the contract um, and, and so it really varies and, it, and it's quite interesting to see um, you know compliance and legislation is being used increasingly in in cyber security uh, and you know it's interesting to see how much it is helping the industry um, but you, to your question, how how do you go about it? Um, it? It really does depend. So GDPR was was quite broad and obviously um, impacted as impacted most companies significantly. So it's running. We ran it as a as a project, and so if it does look like there's a reasonable amount of change required, um, it was run as a project, and you know you have to get the CEO involved and and make sure it has the priority that it needs because unfortunately you know it's not a it doesn't bring in revenue but you you need to be compliance so mm -hmm. uh, you know it's about getting that the a reasonable priority um 
And um, but then other ones like the the NIS regulation um, where Ofcom were uh, regulating us, uh, that was slightly different because um, what what they were asking of us, we kind of already had uh, the evidence in in various forms. So it, we actually worked with Ofcom. You know, I think they're often seen as the bad guys, you know, the regulators, but they're just doing their job and they're trying to make you secure. Um, in the same way, you know, actually, I'll come back onto that. But uh, with with Ofcom, you know, they they were very reasonable. So it was kind of like, look, well, I you're asking for the evidence in this form, but I already have it in in this form, um, and it would take me quite a lot of effort to to translate it. But essentially, the the evidence is there, and we we had discussions about how we could um, manipulate it to meet their requirements without us having to do you know extensive pieces of work. So. Um, so that didn't need a major project and, and that was okay. Um, but I was going to make a comment, yeah, about increasing importance of compliance. It's not just about legislation and um, trying to get that ISO 27001 stamp. You know, I've noticed increasingly with our with our customers, you know, when we're selling, like I said earlier, to, to governments and enterprise, um, you know, they are getting, uh, because of the, the supply chain, they want to secure their supply chain so us as a supplier you know we also have to conform to that so um it's really good to get ahead of the curve on that and make sure um you know your customer and what they are likely to want from security absolutely and what, what do you think the biggest challenges are when you're embarking on that kind of project around you know achieving compliance <sighs> um i'd say yeah two things one i've probably already said um about getting the priority um because it may not necessarily be seen as a generator of revenue so it's it's possibly not a priority um but the second thing is and and i think this is true for most aspects of security and that's uh knowing where your data is knowing where your assets are um you know if if your data is organized um and you you know where it is and, and you've got reasonable it and, and asset management processes about how you uh run the business then it will be fairly easy but if not then you know if you don't know where your data is then that, that's going to be the biggest hindrance so it's a common theme that we've kind of discussed on the show is that if you do the basics right then kind of everything else Kind of falls in line and starts to become a bit easier you know, I, I guess none of these these things are particularly easy but at least if you've got the foundations there it's you know you can just build on those rather than having to kind of reinvent every time so um, oh, yeah, totally. what, what would be your top tip for achieving compliance or meeting some kind of new legislation as smoothly as possible well i think it's pretty basic response but it, it's like plan early you know prepare for it um so you know what you've got to do i think whenever it was may the 8th 2018 i think a lot of businesses um in the sort of few months prior to that um you know almost ddos themselves because mm. they they knew they got this deadline looming and, and they had to be compliant um but if if you sort of plan it appropriately early on then it doesn't have to stop the business you can you can just sort of make sure you're compliant over time um, but coming back to that, yeah, if you haven't got the basics right, then you you know you've got to do those first before um, you you can be fully compliant. Yeah, and, and like as you said earlier, I think getting that that senior stakeholder buy-in when you need it is is probably important as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Kath. Excellent, thank you. And just to be totally clear, Steve, you you don't need an invitation at all for this show. You're always <laughs> welcome, as is everybody that. that comes to this show. So don't worry about that at all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your insights there, Kath. Really appreciate that. Um, I think that we've got a few questions that are coming from the audience as well. So Kerry, what have we got? We do, yes. So the first one comes in from Steph. Um, she's asking, what pieces of legislation do you think will cause the most challenge or change? the CISOs in the coming year? Gosh. Um, I'm aware of uh, 
from a cyber perspective, I know there's a new EU one, but with Brexit, I'm not sure how that's going to affect us. Um, I mean, this isn't really legislation, but I, I would say um, on the sort of compliance side, I think it is, it's getting ever more demanding, like I was saying earlier, that you need to, you know, contracts are becoming more, uh, there's more security content in them. Um, bigger organizations are, you know, they have third party assessment areas where they're checking their supply chain. So I think that might be a change, not a change, it's, it's been a gradual thing that's been ongoing. Um, but I think its compliance as part of contracts is, is changing. Okay, great, thank you. And um, what stakeholders are most important when attempting to lead a project with to meet new legisla legislation? That's from Julie. It has to be the CEO. Um, they, they've got to be bought in from it, but they, they don't need to be involved, um, but they need to be aware of it. Um, and then, like I say, it's about prioritizing, prioritizing it. Um, but obviously the, you know, the, the legal team uh, to help you navigate all the, the legislation, it, it's um, often difficult to, to navigate through and, and what does it mean and translate it into, uh, you know, the language of your or business and um, and also I'd say the, the CIO is, is pivotal in it because they're often, you know, running the systems that manage your data. So it's about um, seeing how best to fit the requirements with, with what you've currently got. Okay, and um, we've got a question in from Harrison. Um, he's saying that we know CISO struggle to get um, buy-in from the board. What advice would you give to a CISO who's trying to raise their profile of the security team in the organisation? Um, that's a really good question. Um, my advice would be um, to keep it quite simple. Uh, I think it's very good. I personally, yeah, I've just been working on a um, a dashboard for um, Nominet's leadership team, um, and and even though behind, you know, and and trying to make it as simple as possible because it's sort of like, you know, we want something every month that can be so are, are we, how secure are we? And are we secure enough? I think are the, the big questions that a board wants to know. And so it's about answering those big questions in, in the best way possible. So I, I would look at using things like um, a capability maturity matrix. So you can kind of say, you know, this is where we are. And where do we want to be? You know, it's... Uh, it, depending on what business you're in depends on how important security is so I think it's uh, put yourself in the board shoes and board's shoes and ask yourself um, what questions will they be asking you and then try and um, make it as jargon free and as informative as possible even though you know there will be loads of complexity behind these dashboards and, and figures mm -hmm. um, but just give them what they need to know and um, when you need help. And then finally, um, we've got one in from Raj. He's saying, what's the biggest challenge that you face from COVID? From COVID? Um, I'm presuming in a work capacity, because the, I think the, <laughs> the thing that jumps straight to the front of my mind is, uh, yeah, like I say, I've got, to, I've got a son and he's homeschooling. And so having to, you know, juggle, um, you know, I can't, I can't, he's got to manage himself, which is a learning experience, but uh, it's sort of juggling that with, with the work environment. Um, but I, I'm assuming he's, he's asking from a, a sort of CISO role. Um, and I, I think it has to be making sure you're, you're keeping up the relationships with the wider organization, you know what's going on. Um, is, is the kind of broadest sense because you know we've got we've got new people starting um, people will be working differently uh, it's it's very natural and you, you you just don't have the same visibility as to when you're in the the office that you you know you have to sort of find the information rather than it finding you if, if that makes sense so I think it's it's keeping in touch with everybody um, and mm -hmm. making sure 
uh, things are things are running as expected. Great, thank you, Kath. Great. Well, another excellent round of questions today from our audience. So thank you very much for that. Also, thank you very much to you, Kath, for giving us your insights and also answering those uh, questions from our audience uh, today as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure to have you here, Kath. Um, uh, but before we go lovely. today's uh, to, for, before we wrap up today's show, uh, please do stick around, Kath, to uh, hear Kerry's wrap up of uh, of our news stories today. Kerry. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Infosecurity Magazine reports that a virtual gradu graduation ceremony was delayed due to a cyber attack. Florida Gulf Coast University was due to hold the event on the 3rd of May, uh, but service provider StageClip began suffering glitches in their system, which turned out to be a cyber attack. On the BBC, there's an article warning at the UK and US about foreign cyber spies targeting the health sector. UK sources have said that uh, they've seen extensive activity, but they don't believe there's been any data theft as yet. The NCSC have been working with affected businesses to help them protect through the crisis. And then finally, there's an interesting article in Forbes, not that Forbes, um, that looks at the first 100 days of cybersecurity and COVID-19. And thank you very much, Kerry. I guess some of the news uh, there today actually goes back to some of the points you were making, Kath, earlier as we kind of settle into this new normal, uh, us being kind of more more spread out than, than perhaps we were before uh, in, in many ways. Um, it, the cyber cyber vectors and the attacks there are still uh, uh, are still prevalent. Um, we're, we're seeing those classic hacking techniques uh, used to exploit the, the current situation. Is that kind of some of the challenges that you, you're also facing right now as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've seen quite an increase um, in, uh, you know, sort of phishing terms relate, well, obviously we're DNS and, and domain names. So um, we're, we've been actively monitoring that and, and helping to support the NCSC uh, with suspending um, domain names that, uh, are likely to be used for, for phishing or a, a fraudulent. We're working with the authorities on that. Um, so that's good. But um, yeah, the, the campaigns look up. Um, and so it, it's about us all remaining alert uh, yeah. in this sensitive time. Yeah, and it's a theme that we've we've um, we've covered time and again on this show is, is making sure that everyone remains especially vigilant right now as we're more arguably more so reliant on on technology to, uh, uh, to to provide that kind of business continuity for us so i think that's a point well made steve you're you popped up on screen again as well which means you must have some commentary against today's news yeah i thought the uh, the first news item was interesting about that virtual graduation ceremony um there have been many reports in the past that when schools go back after the summer holidays in september um, cyber attacks against schools increase and when they're on holiday they decrease therefore leading to the assumption that it's actually the pupils that are leading these kind of cyber attacks and, and DDoS attacks on school networks etc. Um, taking Kath's point about kind of homeschooling and I'm, uh, I have the same thing here I'm um, really surprised that we haven't heard about more DDoS style attacks on online learning platforms uh, by students that are bored of doing homeschooling and decide to practice uh, <laughs> their cyber skills on, on some of these platforms. I guess it's credit to those platforms that they've put mitigations in place, knowing that that's highly likely and is a, it's a high risk. Yeah. And, and we're certainly not advocating that anyone should do that oh, uh, no, to, no. Uh, to get out of homeschooling. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point that uh, maybe the uh, the attention starts to shift elsewhere, as you say. So um, yeah, thank, thanks for those comments. And thank you again uh, for uh, for you joining us uh, today with us as well, Kath. So that is it for today. Um, Kath Golding, CISO here at Nominet. Uh, just a quick heads up before we go. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be speaking to Alex Crompton, who's Head of Security Consulting at BAE Systems. Uh, he'll be joining us to talk about managing security through sustained emergency situations, such as the one we see right now with COVID-19. So please do tune in for us tomorrow for that. Uh, until then, have an excellent rest of the day and see you soon. Goodbye.